everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode 112. And we, as always, are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and willin'. Maxon, relaxing, ready to serve it up, I think. And I am Don Riley. If you would like to subscribe to the program, you can, or you would like to listen to past episodes online, you can go to the Band Books website at 1517.org slash podcast slash band books or you can find us on social media specifically facebook and instagram and are we on instagram yeah and we're on I twitter am. too and we're on twitter too are we on instagram and no i don't think we are i am so that's dom and riley 1517 on instagram if you want yeah. access to articles and podcasts and so forth and then lastly if you like the show review us on apple podcasts or your podcast platform that you stream from and share us with friends, family, and maybe even your enemies, depending on whether you like the show or not. Or your pastor. Or your pet. Well, I mean. Mm. I mean, it might get him in trouble, but. Don't want to open that can of worms. I, I found <laughs> out that um, the show we did on the, the mission at Nuremberg, so the, mm -hmm. the trial at Nuremberg, um, yeah. a family member bought the book and said, started reading it, talked to their pastor about it, and the pastor was reading the book too, at the same time, because cool. they must listen to the show. So, there you go. Thank you all. It's a great book. Yeah, it was engaging, man. Yeah, definitely something to go back to again. I think so. But today, we're not talking about World War II anymore, and we took a little break to talk about the collex or collex, depending on how liturgical you are. Mm -hmm. And so today, we're going to dive back in time, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. We're going to talk about free will and predestination, one of our personal favorite conversations to have. <laughs> Yeah, when did we talk about that last? Uh, uh, bondage of the will. Bondage of the will, that's right. And we're going to go backwards, though, because I think what's very engaging for myself, anyways, is to look at the vast divides within the early church on this topic, mm. even more so than the Middle Ages and for Luther and even for modernity. Didn't I quote Zasa? I can't remember if it was in the bondage of the will context, but how he said that all of the church fathers were... Um, synergy. Yes, that's right. Yes, that they all believe that they that you somehow your will cooperates in salvation. Right. Well, and that's what is engaging about it for myself too. Is if you look at modern American Christianity from even the colonies to the present tense, so modern in the, in the sense of after the Enlightenment, what you end up with is really more theolo They're more theologically grounded in the early church than they are really in the in the Middle Ages or the Reformation, mm -hmm. even though most of the churches in the United States are Reformation era. They're children of the Reformation. So they know doctrine more than they know the Bible? Correct. Okay. Yeah. But it's doctrine that's absorbed through popular culture too, because... Filtered, like, yeah. Yeah, it's filtered through TV and through movies and other media. This idea of good and evil, mm -hmm. yin and yang, karma, black and white, the devil and Jesus constantly battling for your soul. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. But you notice all of the conversations, regardless of the players or the symbolism or the doctrine, the the subtext, the foundation of every single American Christian, American religious, civil religious conversation is free will. Hmm. It's all about choice. It is. We think about where we are today, and I had an interesting idea that actually pop culture is like the more – Mm, thinky pop culture, for for lack of a better way of describing yeah. it, is usually ahead of the curve. If you look at like film, um, you think of like the conversation in in like The Matrix, right, which is entirely about the will, right? Um, and that was happening, and obviously it was happening in the school of philosophy before, long before that. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't happening in pop culture, and, and so I wonder if it's like the the culture that I think what you just suggested maybe is true that the culture that we swim in becomes our language it becomes the right. way that we talk and now yeah. we all think that we're like part of a construct and that we can create our own meaning but we are actually taught that <laughs> by these very popular you know science yes. fiction right or star wars and, or whatever it is yeah. right it's inescapable right i've i've had people give me books such as the gospel of star wars mm -hmm. right in which i've had to politely receive the book and say thank you and then judge in the moment, is it the right tact to explain Gnosticism to these folks, or is it just better for me to accept the book and yeah. read it and be informed and then bring it back around, maybe in a more subversive way through Bible study or, or whatever it might be in the sermon? But there was an article I read uh, last week that suggested 
uh, that the current like uh, runs of film, with some exceptions, of course, but um, so, some of the more not popular but um, more what, critically accepted stuff uh, mm-hmm. is swinging in a more conservative direction. They're really swinging, swinging hard away from progressivism, which yeah. is what we're swimming in now. But the culture, the cultural elements, are trying to inform us, trying to pull us back. And yeah. so I, that got me thinking about this. Like, uh, you know, we'll see the effect of that over you know the next whatever five ten years right you know did, are they going to be successful and if history bears out it's actually true we talked about that with like uh like the the gospel music um, boom right mm-hmm. in america and then you know a generation later you find lutheran churches that actually believe the doctrine that those gospel songs right taught. and then a generation after that you get pop culture right. aping the language and picking up the theology on the sly from yeah, yeah. the songs and, yeah. uh, you know, a perfect example is people like Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, and others who grew up in the church, and then when they transitioned to pop music, rock and roll, they brought with the they brought with them the rhythms and the melodies and the harmonies from, and the call and response mm-hmm, right. uh, form, and then they popularized that, and but they also brought in the language that they grew up with, the language of the church. Yeah. And, but not, and not necessarily just the language of the church, but also the language of good and evil, right and wrong, sinners and saints. And the language of the blues, for example, is obviously marinated in biblical language because there's all the talk of the devil right. and different commandments that you're breaking and judgment day and the freedom train and so forth and so on. And then at just generation after generation, we forget the roots and we are left with just the stems. There's the argument that all Western culture is is a Christian culture. Yeah, Judeo-Christian ethic. Yeah, what's grounded, not just in the ethic of it, but but that it's it's haunted by Christianity. I forget who said that. Uh, Flannery O'Connor. Is that right? Yeah, Christ haunted. The South isn't so much Christ-centered as it is Christ haunted. There you go. That's what I'm thinking of. All right, so yeah. somebody, we're going to look at early church. So um, sorry, you didn't get to say what we're going to read, but uh, Justin Martyr, second century. So what's the what's the like cultural context that he's swimming in? Right. And that is a, how does that going to inform him? You know, second century, this is post- uh, well, Christianity's not legal yet, is it? Right. Well, let me read about it then. So, Justin Martyr, who lived roughly approximately from 100 to 165. So, yeah, not popular yet to be a Christian. Not, not a good thing. Generally dying, yeah. <laughs> he was a philosopher who converted to Christianity and, uh, as a consequence, was an evangelist and apologist. Hmm. Justin wrote more concerning Christianity than any other person prior to his time. He is classified as Eastern not Western, as okay. far as church goes, okay. since he was a native of Samaria, and his thought patterns were Eastern in their their thought context, their philosophical bent. In Eastern in the sense of Greek, too, not Eastern in, or Western in the sense of Rome. Right, exactly. He's very much uh, a Platonic or uh, Aristotelian. He's Neoplatonic, but we'll get to that. Yeah, the West doesn't get to Aristotle until much later. Much later, exactly. However, Justin spent the last years of his life in Rome, where he was then executed as a martyr, thus Justin Martyr. That was B-165. And so I thought we would start with Justin because he is a philosopher by trade, by vocation, when he's converted. And as we will touch upon, but not get too deep in, because I don't want to bore people to death with mm-hmm. Neoplatonic thought, what you're going to end up with is a Platonic understanding of free will, which is ironic because Plato himself actually rejected free will for the most part. And he was very much a nature versus nurture kind of guy. It's a kind of deism, right? It was a kind of deism for him because he also rejected the fates Mm -hmm. Um, as a consequence. You either have to reject that there's gods because if the fates rule over everything, then even the gods are subject to fate. So why bother worshiping gods? Uh, Or there are gods and no fate, but then if there's no fate guiding the course of your life, your destination, your destiny... Well, then how do we get from birth to death and everything that happens in between? Why does it happen? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's where free will comes in. But the Neoplatonics... Yeah, it's either God-directed or it's not. Yes. So then the Neoplatonists, the students of Plato, took that and ran with it and did what every school does uh, with their their guru or their thinker or their their founder, which is expand upon and tweak and change and modify. Twist, adjust. (laughs) Twist, adjust. (laughs) Right. And so when we read Justin, he's going to be filtering Plato or the Neoplatonics through the filter of the Bible. And remember, in 100 to 165, it was extremely rare, if not, what, impossible to find a Bible? A complete Bible? That's true. And so we don't know which text Justin had or didn't have, so therefore we don't know where he's getting his doctrine from. Because when I say I read the Bible holistically, I mean Genesis to Revelation. 
But Justin might mean the Psalms, a prophet, one or two gospels, and maybe a couple epistles of Paul. We're at least a hundred years before you have like pretty strong cases for what is a canon of the right, scripture, exactly. what books should be included. And so as much as I disagree with Justin and just about everything he says, I also have to take into consideration that he has access to a very narrow number of sources. Plus apostolic succession means something different to these folks. Yeah. Because we're still within a generation or two technically at this time, probably two generations of those who studied with the original disciples. Right. And that was kind of how you measured, that was how you measured apostolic succession is, did you train with one of the apostles, the disciples? Right, right, right. And then did you train with one of the disciples of the disciples? Well, maybe just give an example. Like if you had um, only, I don't know, one of the gospels, that could really radically change uh, how you think of Jesus' ministry. Like if you only had Mark, all you're going to, you're going to really be focused on things like, uh, like exorcism and... um, Snake handling. Yeah, like like power and authority and, and mm-hmm. just invas you know, the invasive gospel. Right. right? Just kinda gets in. Whereas in John, you're gonna be, you know, much more well, high and deep, I suppose is the way to right. put it. You're gonna be out in a field listening to the Grateful Dead talking about DMT and <laughs> Maybe. Spiritual awakenings. <laughs> That's a good analogy, I suppose. You don't uh, understand, man. There's layers to this. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just keep digging in and dig going deeper. Uh, pretty heady stuff. That's a good way to put it. So uh, that's going to really inform then the way you you talk, or even how you well, even how you can con- your conception of who Jesus is, or if you didn't have the Old Testament, right? I was just about to say that Chad and I talk about this. Chad Bird and I talk about this that because we're both more Old Testament guys, we spend a majority of our time in the Old Testament. When you talk with folks who spend a majority of their time in the New Testament, we're we're confessing the same Savior, but the language is different. Mm-hmm. The piety is radically different, actually. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For, for different reasons, but <clears throat> like you said, it's just it's it's just a different way of expressing the same thing. It is and it isn't. I mean, it, it does seem to be that you have a de- like a depravity of you know who Jesus is when you don't yeah. have you don't have him leading Israel right. into battle. You know, for example, right? If you don't like, if I come out of Joshua and Judges and I formulate my confession of who Jesus is as Savior and the two kingdoms and everything based on Joshua and Judges, whereas your predominant text is Luke and Acts. Neither one of us is, quote-unquote, wrong. We're both quoting from the Word of God. We're still claiming God's that Scripture is God's Word. It's the authority that norms our norm. But Joshua and Judges is radically different historically and in action mm-hmm. as to what God does and doesn't do versus Luke and Acts. You just don't have the whole person, I guess, is the way it is. <clears throat> right. You could say yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> And so when we get to Justin, I think next episode we'll probably dive into Irenaeus, who's a relative contemporary, but he's a bishop out of Lyon, which is modern day France. So he's kind of on the French Riviera, so to speak. And he, Irenaeus, is reacting. Again. Is that is that where you race F one cars? Yes. Okay. Good. Le Mans. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. I've been Have to you the South France? Yeah. Yeah. And. Irenaeus is is defending the the fleshiness, the mm-hmm. incarnation of Jesus against the Gnostics who deny that he was literally flesh and blood. Justin is in the East. He's in a Greek world, a Greek culture. And bodiliness, as we're about to discover, I think a little bit, they had a problem with that too. It's just that Irenaeus fought against it, whereas in the East, they're like, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, Kinda. The, the influence <laughs> of Gnosticism was much stronger. Yeah, it was. And mysticism, Middle Eastern mysticism, mm-hmm. Zoroastrianism, stuff like that. Stars and planets, yep. Yeah, right. So let's just dive in. And I'm just going to read excerpts from Justin. Um, I think this is from his Enchiridion, and this is around, uh, what, 160 it looks like? Yep. Or no, he's, ex- yeah. In the beginning, God made the human race with the power of thought and of choosing the truth and doing right, so that all men are without excuse before God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? So his assumption then is that from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God made all of us, or at least pre-fall human yeah, humanity, yeah. we had the ability to think for ourselves and to choose the truth. I'm going to assume he means capital T, truth, right. but he could also mean morally the truth, and then doing what is morally right. He definitely means moral right there. Mm-hmm. So then before God... You are without excuse in what you do and what you don't do at the judgment day. So God says, 
you can eat of any of these trees, you can't eat of that tree. Right. right. And then he left it to their ability to choose mm. to say, are we going to obey that or are we going to right. go against that? Right. And he chose <laughs> unwisely. Yeah. They're ultimately then responsible for their actions. Correct. Mm -hmm. And as I've argued, I argue this in the book, then that sets up creation as a test. Yes. All of creation is a test. And depending on how you do on the test, you either go up or down when you die. Mm -hmm. And the only problem I have with that is that that's literally the explanation of every religion. And maybe in contrast to that would be God's revealing how a life apart from him is yes. a life doomed to, to sin and death and hell. Well, and this goes to the early church, and Augustine is the guy who kind of formulates this for us in such a way that it translates into all Western, the Western church, is that there's this, what has God done versus what he doesn't do, and then what is the role of sin? And for Augustine, then sin is concupiscence, it's a lack of the right kind of love. Mm. Meaning if you love God, that's the right kind of love. If you love God, if you love yourself or your neighbor more than God, that's the wrong kind of love. And so for Augustine, the first commandment is about love and misplaced love. Dr. Luther, and this is really the 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 bedrock of the Reformation, is saying, no, that's actually not concupiscence at all. In fact, I've got a book by Thomas Tentler called Sin and Confession on the Eve of the Reformation. Oh yeah. Where he where he tracks this and then says the real, like quote unquote, reformation of the church was when the Saxons showed up and said, This is wrong. Like, you don't understand sin, then this is why you have this penitential system. Mm -hmm. Because for them, following Augustine's teachings, sin is the wrong kind of love. And so, if you love God the right way, you can love your neighbor the right, the right way. If you love God the wrong way, you love your neighbor the wrong way, and that's sin. And so, the purpose of penance is to order your loves in such a way that they are pointed in the right direction. And that then, ultimately, all sin is love gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Dr. Luther and the Reformers said, no, actually, the first commandment, the first table of law isn't about love, it's about faith. And yeah. that sin is actually the absence of true faith. Right. And that if, if your love, <laughs> if your love is, is properly directed, that's actually by God's action. Well, this is why the late Middle Ages said love forms faith versus the Reformation, <clears throat> which says no faith, faith forms love, produces yeah. love, because that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so for Justin here, It's a fruit of the setting, Spirit. It's explicitly yes. listed as fruit right. of the Spirit. Explicitly the fruit of the Spirit. So likewise then, once you assume with Justin that from the beginning, God gave us free will and that the fall hurt that, crippled it, but didn't extinguish it altogether, even if you agree with his argument, mm -hmm. there's a little bit left. There's a little bit of choice left after the fall because we have to have a little bit of choice ultimately because then as to Justin's point, how can we be with a, without excuse before God's judgment seat if we had no choice to begin with, which, the by the way, place. for those of you who remember, this is Erasmus's argument mm -hmm. with Luther, al you know, almost a thousand years later, or over a thousand years later, I'm sorry, 1400 years. So the, the power of thought and choosing the truth and doing right, he would, I, I think he would suggest that that is the definition of the image of God. That's what it means to Absolutely. be in God's image. Yeah. To be morally good or right, to have the, to choose between truth and falsehood whether that truth is Jesus or just philosophically the mm -hmm. truth. Right. And then ultimately, yeah, you have the power to think for yourself. Unlike the animals. That's, unlike animals, exactly. And also, by the way, the Enlightenment took this, and this is why they put humanity outside of creation and why we're constantly trying to fix creation. Somewhere between, what, the angels and, and the creatures? Yeah. Right. Is that we, we think because we have a brain that is, and we have consciousness, we're outside of creation, we're not a part of creation. We have dominion what, over it, but not yeah. not from within it. Just right, exactly above yeah. it. Yeah, we always want to be above, and so ultimately, then the reason that we can be judged and the reason we're without excuse for Justin is you have the power to think for yourself and then to act on those thoughts, which is very philosophical. That means you're ultimately responsible for yourself. Then, yeah, I think, therefore, I am. Mm -hmm. But, he continues then, lest some suppose from what has been said by us that we say that whatever occurs happens by a fatal necessity, because it is foretold as known beforehand, this too we explain. We have learned from the prophets, and we hold it to be true, that punishments, chastisements, and good rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's actions. Now, if this is not so, but all things happen by fate, then neither is anything at all in our own power. For it is predetermined that this man will be good, and this other man will be evil. Neither is the first one meritorious, nor the latter man to be blamed. And again, unless the human race has the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, 
they are not accountable for their actions. Ooh. Which, go to 1517 and read, I think, my last two or three articles hmm. that contradicts this. <laughs> I've heard this from, I mean, it's basic, the basic objection of every you know, student in catechesis. Correct. Like, how can I be responsible for what Adam and Eve did? Right. Or how can I be responsible for what I do if, I, if Romans 7 is true? Ah, yeah, there's that too. Meaning, and every atheist. And speci specifically, like, yeah, I cannot control myself. Right. Which is what Romans 7 says, yeah. But this is also then, to walk it back, whatever happens occurs by fatal necessity. This is why Dr. Luther, in his response to Erasmus in the bondage of the will, later was called a necessitarian. They invented that word for him. Really? Because Luther argues that, according to Scripture, everything happens by necessity. That a God chooses your salvation before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1. He also predetermines your good works before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 2. So he's constantly going back to Paul, well, you, those whom we foreknew, he predestined, those who he predestined, he glorified, those mm -hmm. who, you know, so forth and so on. That for Luther, this is comforting if it's grounded in Christ crucified for you. It is not comforting if you start before creation like Justin or Augustine or others do and then work your way up to the cross because then by the time you get to Calvary, you're asking, well, what's the point if everything's predestined? How is that necessary? Yeah, which, by the way, is double predestination a la Calvinism. Mm, I, was, I was thinking about this. You know, our confession is that he will come to judge the living and the dead, and that was certainly— Correct. That was Justin's, too. But right. how—I mean, that, that sounds like fatal necessity— like this is what yeah, yeah. all things are spinning out towards this, right. namely towards the cross, and then into the into the last day. The day yeah, of it's judgment. inevitable. We are in the last days. But like I explain countless times in this in our in our Wednesday morning Christ Old Fast, uh, the Facebook Live devotion, in Hebrew there's two words for judgment: one's punitive and one's justification. Mm -hmm, right. In English, we don't. <laughs> it's all judgment. It's judgment, and it's usually seen as a derogatory term. Don't judge me. It's like the judge the the ver the, the judgment of you know, the judge, the verdict of the judge can be not guilty or justification in, yeah. in a theological sense. Well, right. Go to the parable of the unjust steward, for example, or just the parable of the vineyard and the workers that I uh, was our reading this past weekend. Yeah. And that judge, the judge can declare a verdict that isn't even fair. <laughs> right. It's not just. <laughs> Which, according to guys like Justin, is why we have to have free will, because we cannot actually interpret those parables that way, mm. because then that would mean that we ultimately are not responsible for anything except rejecting the invitation to come to the wedding feast, rejecting the invitation for, I'll give you $120 for an hour's work, right? that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And, that's un and that's unjust, not according to God's own, you know, revelation of what justice is, but rather yeah. by our estimation and you know, what's written in our heart, I suppose, if you want to speak theologically. Right. No, the moral law. Yeah, but we put God in the judgment seat. Well, and that's a great point, though, to bring up and a good segue into what Justin does, too, is he conflates the moral law with the law of Christ, or the law of grace, as Paul calls it, which he's mocking his opponents at that point. He's not saying there's an actual law of grace. He's saying, listen, if you want to argue from the perspective of the law, I can do that, too, but I'm going to argue from the law of grace, mm -hmm. meaning there is no law. <laughs> that it's like James says, right? That you are, you are. It is an imperative that you be free. Yeah, the law of liberty, the law of freedom, compels us. Meaning, the the only law there is now is that God demands you be free. But the moral law in our hearts demands that we not be free. And like I texted you earlier, this is why we demand freedom of choice while simultaneously, secretly hoping that someone will come along to speak authoritatively and tell us to tell us to what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I went over that. We were talking about uh, on my road trip this weekend, just talking about how um, we we're entirely autonomous congregations by some you know strange yeah <laughs> chance you know just the, the transplanting of you know Episcopal Lutheran churches into America and taking on you know Methodism basically right as far as a governance structure and, and but but yet our congregations demand authority but only um, when they fail to take. Um, responsibility for themselves. That's basically Correct. how it works. Yeah. Yes. You know, they want somebody to come tell them what to do when they don't want to make the decision themselves. Yes. Everyone's a victim. No one's responsible. <laughs> Which is pretty much terrible. Yeah. Well, and this goes to the point then too, if it is predetermined that this man will be good and this other man will be either evil, 
Neither is the first one meritorious nor the latter man to be blamed. This is the beginning. You see now the roots of double predestination. Mm -hmm, if right. you have some free will in relation to salvation, then why are some people evil? Why are some people, why do they lie on their taxes? Why do they commit adultery when their spouse isn't looking? Why do they rob and cheat and lie and steal when they have a choice? And they know because of the moral law of their hearts, natural law, what is right and wrong. Therefore, the only explanation ultimately can be they're actually sinning against God, and they're they're damned, and that's the explanation. Now, Justin Justin wouldn't argue. I mean, I, I know he wouldn't argue that you're entirely responsible for your salvation. You're only partially, right? Right. Your will is it, it contributes to that. Would right. he argue that you're entirely responsible for your damnation, like we would, or yeah, or would he say no? Actually, you're under. Um, some kind of external forces as well, the devil, the world, you know, they're the ones that contribute to that. Right, well, that's, that's that. because, you know, 100%, and, and yeah, I'll walk that back, that's 100% correct, because for these guys, there's the DMZ, the no man's land between good and bad. Mm. And your choices are, in, and this goes to the accounting method of salvation too then, how many times do you choose the right path versus the wrong path? Do you come back? Do you repent? And then at the end of the day, what you really just hope for is that you have more credit than debit. Or I'm sorry, you have more black than red ink, or red ink than black ink in your in your ledger. Which, of course, makes you a pretty terrible pastor, by the way. Makes you a terrible person, because <laughs> you hate person God. Too. But what do you, just you say? What do you, well, we were discussing this over the weekend. What do you, what do you say to someone um, who's lost a child, say, in childbirth or miscarriage? Correct. Or, or what do you say to someone who's, you know, child suicides? Right. right? Are you well, going one, to say, yeah. well, yeah. obviously, I mean, they took advantage of the will that they have— uh, and used it for evil, and yep. it's really hard for us to say, you know, that that God died for them, which yeah. is that's what the double predestination person would say. It's like yes. based off the evidence, I'm really not so sure right. we can say anything good. Right. Whereas, you know, what are you doing? To, what are you actually doing to God in that situation? <laughs> right. And to His Word and to His own character. Right. You know. Well, I, you and I both joked about this with other people. If we go by that standard, most of my kids, most of the time are not baptismally regenerated. Yeah, they're little heathen kids. They're just savages. Exactly. You're like, what is wrong with you? It's like this morning, each one of them woke up in their own time, and the first thing each one did when they came in the kitchen is throw the rest of the kids under the bus. Like, they're uh, just like... That's beautiful. You know, so-and-so <laughs> said this, or so-and-so did that. I'm like, really, the first thing that you think of when you walk in the room is, I'm going to cause pain to everybody else in this room <laughs> to make I, myself feel how good. How can I make everyone else's life miserable? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> as soon as possible. And then when I call them to account and say, is this really important that you do this? And their answer is always, well, no. If you want to see an, another place this plays out with children, I've just thought of uh, how the old folks say, you know, well, he had the devil in him. Yes. Like, what? <laughs> right. What are you saying about... I mean, it's often about like their grandchild or you know, right. a child of somebody else. Yeah, he's somebody such a little child. devil. You're like, what? <laughs> right. What are you saying about baptism, for example? <laughs> right. But and, this is this is to our point, is that these little throwaway, these little cliches, these little platitudes are harmless, they're benign, but they have a deeper rooting in some actual doctrine. That's been around a long time. That's been around since Justin and before, and it comes out in popular culture through popular language and mm -hmm. idioms and colloquial, uh, what do you call them? Uh, colloquialisms. Yeah. And so it's very, it sounds great. It's pretty, you know, did God predetermine some for good and some for evil? Well, it gets us off the hook for predestination then yeah. and having to explain that. So his his problem here is that if there's predetermination by God, the yeah. man will be good and then that that means he, it, he can't be meritorious. Correct. And, and if he's evil, predetermined to be evil, then he right. can't be blamed because it's right. just God's doing. And Remember what Erasmus argues, if we don't have any free will, like no choice at all, then God himself is unrighteous because how can you possibly damn Pharaoh mm -hmm. for hardening his heart if he had no choice about that? How can you damn Judas if he had no choice about betraying Jesus? How can you damn Esau? So forth and so on. So there's got to be, even if it's just a little bit, again, that sliver of choice, there's got to be something there. There's got to be, because otherwise God's arbitrary and capricious in his judgments. Of course, the examples you gave, just to respond to that, yeah, um, all three of those guys actually, what hardened their heart or their rejection of God was the rejection of his word. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that they had a problem with love. Mm -mm. When they didn't have a problem with doctrine, they had a problem with the author of, do of the doctrine himself. Mm -hmm. It was actually Much a hatred like all of the God. religious leaders. It was a hatred of yeah. God. Yeah. Right, exactly. That, uh, Like Robert Capon says about the parable of the vineyard and the workers, the only thing that can damn you is rejecting the good, the gracious goodness of God who just says, I want to give everybody the same. 
I want everybody to be forgiven. That's the whole point of Jesus. I just want everybody to be forgiven. I want to be reconciled to all my creatures. Even in the Pharaoh story, by the way. Yeah, right. Even in the Pharaoh story. And so Pharaoh has to literally like claw his way into hell because God is so busy. Like, no, take the gift. He just doubles down. He just keeps doubling down. Exactly. So that finally God has to say, okay, I can prove you're not a God. If you if you want to demand this so much that you leave me no other options and you want to prove you're a God, I'll just step out of your way. Mm-hmm. All you got to do is rise from the dead, man. And just it's go to the bottom test. of the sea. Yeah. Right. Let's see you come out of that. And so for Justin, Annie Rasmus, and others, um, Pharaoh made that choice. And Pharaoh hardened his own heart over and over and over and over again. Well, surely he did, though. Surely. Because it says... God but, uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart. Obviously, God by speaking Pharaoh hardened to his him. own heart. How dare yes. God speak to him? <laughs> well, Erasmus' justification, I think we read, was, well, Pharaoh must have hardened his heart before God hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that heart, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, because God would never harden his heart if Pharaoh himself hadn't hardened his heart previous to God hardening his heart. Did I ever tell you about my Exodus um, class at seminary that was team taught? <laughs> hmm. Oh, this is... If I did tell you, it would have been a long time ago. Good cop, bad cop? Yeah, it was good cop, bad cop. It wasn't intentionally set up that way. Um, (laughs) But, you know, one one came in and gave exactly the Erasmus argument. Yeah. Tried to justify God's word in in this hardening of Pharaoh's heart and wanted to to suggest, wanted to basically make God not the villain there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to justify justify God's own actions. Um, And then the other, the next day, the other professor came in and said, actually, I think we should just read it as the text is given to us. (laughs) Correct. And believe, you know, the word as God revealed it through Moses, that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's the kind of, you know, and this is, and then he actually quoted Lutheran Confessions, which I don't agree, you know. Right. Oh, wait a minute, I'm at Lutheran Seminary, and now one professor just showed that the other professor isn't Lutheran. This this is going to go well. That's awkward. Awkward. Mom and dad are fighting again. (laughs) It was fun times, though. But it does go to make a great point that usually what ends up happening, as we've read in so many theologians, if the text doesn't support your presuppositions, mm. you go behind the text and say, well, what isn't said is what happened before Moses and Aaron came and talked to Pharaoh. Or, well, there, God was doing stuff behind the scenes that we're not aware of, which, by the way, is the original temptation of the serpent. Correct. He didn't tell God's you all. He didn't out. tell you everything. He didn't tell you everything. And if you eat this, you'll know everything. There's a little bit more. Knows. Yeah. Huh. And then, and the reason I bring that up too is one of the things that I would knock Justin and others for, and something that I'm hyper aware of coming out of atheism is, listen, Justin assumes that his philosophical presuppositions and worldview agree with the Bible. That God is inherently good by our definition. Yeah, and that we have free will, and that the Bible doesn't contradict these teachings. Mm-hmm. This is Luther's ar- argument for Erasmus's Christian philosophy. Listen, man, your, your whole reading of the Bible is wrong because you haven't tested your own presuppositions against the Word of God. Mm-hmm. You're overstanding, not understanding the Word yeah, of God. Yeah, we've talked about that. And so, I think that's, and I just want to bring it up because I do think it's a, it's a super crucial point when you're reading the early church guys. They just assume that Platonism or Neoplatonism or Aristotelian philosophy is the same logic that Moses and Paul are using. Or at least it's a wisdom that's on the same, you know, level. Equal to, or yeah, equal, yeah. maybe slightly lesser, but, you know, they would argue that philosophically you can get there. You can get that's what, really close. You can't get to Jesus, right. but Look you can— Right, at apologetics in the early church. Sure. They argue philosophically, and like you said, they get close, and Jesus himself is the fullest expression of God's wisdom in a philos sense, mm-hmm. philia sense, but that ultimately apologetics leads you to the door, and then we'll open it for you and say, actually, the wisdom you're searching for is Jesus himself. No, and that might not be uh, an invalid approach. I mean, Paul does that a little bit. I do it right all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then again, it's not the You've revelation. Got to stop. It's not the revelation of Scripture, right? Exactly. That's you, my point. Is yeah. you and I talked about this yesterday about being a Stoic, and many of the fighters I train with are Stoic, philosophically speaking, mm-hmm. and there's a reason. But what's well, a mindfulness, right? Well, it's a lot of things, and it's all the things that come up, and that you're forced to confront about your own way of thinking and your presuppositions and your heart and your ego and blah 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 blah. blah when you're in a situation like you're in when you're sparring or competing mm-hmm. in a fight or a mm-hmm. tournament. But it makes you very philosophical because you're asking these deeper questions like, why am I doing this? Or if you're a Christian, and as I've said before, all of the the professional fighters I train with are Christians, devout Christians. They, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a fighter. How do these gel with each other? Do I turn the other cheek? How do I love my neighbors myself? Like mm-hmm. These are huge questions that they have to confront because they're devout Christians. And then when I do apologetics to non-Christians within that context, 
I use Stoic philosophy to bring them to that point because, as I brought up before, a guy like Marcus Aurelius believes that the nature of God is love and the nature of creation is love your neighbor as yourself and that we're built to love each other and serve each other and sacrifice for each other. He's a pagan. He gets the golden rule. I can use Marcus Aurelius to bring you to the door, which is Jesus, in the same way that if I were talking with a Jewish person, I would use the, the golden rule to lead to Jesus. But it's not like Jesus plus Marcus Aurelius. Correct. It's Marcus Aurelius has to bend his knee at the end of the day to Jesus because, to quote Luther, reason in relation to salvation is a whore, mm -hmm. but reason in relation to my neighbor is the queen of the faculties. Yeah. And so, you have to hold that tension, that distinction, not dividing, but distinguishing and holding that tension so that you don't turn everything into, well, everything has to be Christian. Yeah. Or, well, everything can be apologized for using earthly philosophy and wisdom. And then Jesus himself just becomes another Moses or another Marcus Aurelius or another Plato, which has happened often. And as a consequence, if you don't, I don't think anyways, my opinion is, if you don't hold that, that tension, then apologetics turns into worldliness covered in Christian language or it becomes overbearingly Christian. And then you're ignorant to the fact that everything you're saying about Christian music or literature or art or talking is actually Greco-Roman. Right. With, you're, you're literally making the same argument in the opposite direction. Yeah. Or uh, in the case of like trying to, by apologetics, we mean defending the faith, by the way. Correct. Um, in defense of the faith, kind of major in the minors and then, and actually yeah. become a poor philosopher. Like uh, this is yeah, especially absolutely. true in the argument, say for, um, you know, the creation narrative. Yeah. And, and talking about six day creation, you're, you're a bad scientist and you're a bad philosopher. Correct. Often in the arguments, at least that I've read, that actually, does damage to some people's faith because you because you have to you have to do the same kind of violence to the to the actual text Correct. to make yeah. it work or you actually have to violate what your reason and your senses see before you mm -hmm. which, right you know might be okay it's certainly true in, in regards to the sacraments <laughs> absolutely right but in terms of, of creation uh, i'm not so sure you can do that yeah no we don't there's we don't know anything we don't know anything. We're not in control. <laughs> We've just all gotten together and said, hey, man, we all have a pretty narrow bandwidth regarding our five senses, so let's all agree that we know everything there is to know until something else comes up. I know. I mean, I like the fossil record. I think it's pretty cool, actually. It's fascinating. Neat it's fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so just enjoy it. I mean, uh, I don't know why it has to be like, um, it has to become like part of our dogma, actually, of our right. public teaching, that we have a we have a way of explaining the fossil record in a way that conforms That's 100 itself. That's 100% correct. And everybody else is wrong. <laughs> right, right. Which is weird. <laughs> it is weird. It's not yeah, even good science either. Yeah, no, no. Uh, but we digress. Yes, uh, we did. Shout out, shout out to the thousand plus years of church history where we supported the sciences and funded them, and the past 300 years when we just basically buried them <laughs> and said they have nothing to do with us. Fundamental yeah. dogmatism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dear listeners, that's the end of the first half of our conversation this week, where we're looking at Justin Martyr. And uh, the next episode, which will be just dropping in a few days, we'll pick up where we left off with Justin and then move into one of Justin's students, Taishin. So, see you soon. Love you all.